Hello everyone, uh, this is um, Charles Beecroft of the Training Manager at NQA, uh, NQA Training. Uh, I'd just like to I welcome you all today uh, to the webinar. Today, as you can see from the screen, um, and you can see that we were talking about getting value from <laughs> compliance obligations. And I'd be happiest to announce that we'll be joined today uh, by Alistair Constantine and Anna Fires from ISO Compliance Register. Thank you very much, Charles. Um... Uh, delighted to uh, to be presenting um, on this NQA webinar uh, this afternoon, and thank you for everyone who's uh, who's joining live. And um, if anyone's watching this on on playback, you're you're very welcome as well. Um, so, just a very brief introduction um, uh, to us. Um, I'm Adam Fares, and my colleague um, Alistair, uh, depending on which way your webcam is set up, is either that way or that way. I think. Um, we um, we run a company called ISO Compliance Register. Um, for the past 15 years, we've been um, delivering sort of consultancy through uh, for all of the ISO standards. Um, and about three or four years ago, we noticed um, we were getting real feedback from uh, from companies of all sizes that um, you know the compliance obligations in particular were a um, a, a difficult sort of area for people to understand and to um, to, to implement into their ISO systems. Um, so we have spent the last, you know, best part of five six years, kind of uh, designing and and um, and building an online uh, compliance obligation tool called ISO Compliance Register. That's what it says on the tin, um, and we believe strongly, you know, that our our belief our our drive to to do this is that uh you know we believe that organizations can get real value from uh compliance obligations um so i'm going to do the first part of the um uh of, of the webinar and then alistair's going to sort of do the second part and then we'll uh, sort of take questions and whatever you want to know um afterwards but first of all i just want to start with a poll um, and I have a question for you. I think you can, uh, you'll get a little polling button up. And my question is, what proportion of organizations uh, who have ISO management standards in place have committed uh, to complying with compliance obligations? So what proportion of organizations have uh, committed to complying with compliance obligations? So there you go, the poll is open. Um, I think you can do that. So uh, there you go. Have a little go at that. Answer the question and then we'll see what answer comes up. So, yeah, we've got 86 percent of people have voted so far. Um, so wait yeah. for the last stragglers and then we'll then we'll, we'll release the rest of the poll. We'll share that. OK, brilliant stuff. I'm waiting on with bated breath to see the answers. Here we go. Are we there, Charles? Have we got that? We've got, yes. Oh, I unfortunately can't actually see it for the moment, but I can let you know now that I'm 18% of the, of the attendees have said 25%. A quarter, okay. 25%, have said 50 23% of 775 and 34 at 100. 34. Okay, so if you're in the 34% uh, who answered 100% of standards, you are absolutely right. Because if you have an ISO management system, um, then you have a policy commitment to comply to applicable statutory and regulatory requirements, to compliance obligations, or to legal and other requirements. So you are 100% of you have made that commitment to comply with uh, compliance obligations. So some of the standards call them slightly different things. So applicable statutory and regulatory, compliance obligations, legal and other requirements. But 100% of organizations have done that. And that's not a surprise, that poll, because that's quite often what we see. When we start talking to organizations, we do say, you know, you have committed to to comply with this stuff. Um, and a lot of people are left scratching and saying, oh, really? I didn't really fully appreciate that. So that is what one of those three commitments in your policy um, are saying. So um, I guess the question then is, you know, what are compliance obligations and, you know, what is the ISO standards trying to, to sort of do with that? Um, 
so compliance obligations, I'll just take this um, uh, definition from 14001, which is that legal compliance obligations are legal requirements and other requirements as well that an organisation has to comply with. Um, and those other things, I'll go into more detail later, but those other things could be um, requirements from a regulator, from a sector body, from your customers, um, something that you've agreed to in a, a sort of a procurement process. Those are the other requirements. Um, so those are things that you have to comply with or things that you choose to comply with. And of course, a lot of the focus is about legal requirements. Um, and remembering that ISO standards are international, um, not every country um, has the same sort of legal base as the UK or the EU. Um, so it's about really through the management systems, through the management standards, organisations are able to say, right, this is the standard, this is the level um, that we want to be at. And the way that comes across in the ISO standards, um, it, it's referenced in every single clause. So those requirements are referenced in pretty much every clause, the exception of clause 10, which is the, non uh, the corrective actions and, and improvement actions, but every single one. So in clause four, where you're identifying your context and your interested parties, it's asking you to understand what your legal requirements are. In clause five, in your leadership and policy, it's saying, right, now make sure that you've got those policy commitments in place. Then in clause six, with obviously the process of identifying what your legal requirements, what your other requirements are, then you can define what your risks are and then what your objectives are. So if you've got some, uh, if you've got, um, if you're looking at health and safety in particular, um, then you might have some health and safety risks and there may be some legal um, uh, sort of association with that as well. So if you're handling chemicals or um, dangerous articles and things, then COSH uh, is a legal requirement. So there is a, a legal requirement associated to your risk. Uh, in clauses seven and eight, which are very much the doing um, uh, clauses, then you have to be mindful that if there are legal requirements around um, competency, around uh, HR, around um, sort of documentation or communication, then you're you're complying with those. And then within your clause eight, which is where you're either manufacturing or you're providing your service, what are the legal um, requirements associated to the to the things that you're actually doing? So that could be anything if you're whether you're operating a call centre, whether you're manufacturing some uh, particular products or you're providing some other sort of service, everything has a, a, a legal uh, sort of point. At, you know, there's a legal um, or, or other requirement at some point that you need to comply with. And then in clause nine, which is very much the, uh, the checking uh, sort of clause, uh, what you're asking, what you're being asked to do there is to evaluate how you're meeting those compliance obligations. So certainly for uh, environmental, for health and safety, for information security, that evaluation of compliance is uh, very important. And then you need to talk about that at the management review um, and then also monitor things as well. So you might have some monitoring and the safety environment or whatever that you need to do. That is that's all part of that clause nine. So legal and compliance obligations, other requirements, whatever they are, they they pervade all the way through the ISO standards. So it's really important that you understand them. And some of the um, benefits then of, of knowing those compliance obligations, what they are, um, certainly with legal and other requirements, um, you know, avoiding litigation and prosecution is, is absolutely critical. So if you know what legislation affects your business, um, then you know what um, what the rules are, you know what you're, you're being asked to do, um, then you would um, be able to avoid litigation and, and prosecution. If those uh, compliance obligations are things that you've agreed to in your supply chain or their customer requirements, you're able to satisfy those, um, uh, you're able to satisfy those better. Um, and what's interesting, a, a lot of compliance obligations, um, whether it's legal or, or whether they are contractual things, will usually have tasks associated that will apply to your business. So, for example, going back to my example on COSH, um, there are certain tasks associated to 
to uh, the control of, of hazardous substances that you need to have in place. So you need to make sure that you have access to your safety data sheets and that you've got access um, that well, you completed sort of associated risk assessments. Um, whatever, um, whatever piece of legislation, there is usually um, a sort of a task associated to it. Some of that, those tasks might be directly uh, applicable to you. Some of those might be indirectly applicable to you. Um, but if you know what they are, then you're in a much better position. And the interesting thing with legislation. So when you hear people talk about legal um, as in statutory and regulatory things, um, statutes which are new acts so if we take on you know take into example the environment act or the online safety act the act there is the um, is the statutory requirement um, and then that is very much setting the basis of what is going to need to be done over time so these are the uh, this is the drumbeat almost of of what this uh, requirement is going to be and then what you have is a, um, a series of regulations, so regulatory requirements uh, that come out of that statute. Now, if you know what the Act is, so if you know what the Online Safety Act is or you know what the Environment Act is, then you'll be able to see in there the types of activities and the types of controls and the interested parties. So who's going to be the regulator for this, for example? Um, you know, who, who are the different actors that are affected by this act? Um, then you'll, if you understand what that legislation is that's coming out, you're going to know how it's going to develop over time. And that will help support your decision making and priority setting. And even down to the point of, right, OK, well, I need to do this or I need to do this. If if the first thing that you've got to do has got a bit of uh, legal requirement against it and the other thing doesn't, then you know that the bit with the legal requirement is probably going to be your priority um, to get done. And as Alistair will talk about, if you know your compliance obligations, um, if you've got a good register, um, uh, a, a good register of, of information, then that's an excellent resource for you that can then be shared um, across the business. It can be shared with everyone in your company. So, you know, right, here's our legal requirements. Here's what our controls are. And then this is how we we manage those things. So uh, now to, to stop you hearing from me just a little bit, I'm going to ask you a second poll. So out of those six um, benefits, which of those do you think would probably give your organization um, the most um, return, if you like? What's the, what's, what's the uh, benefit here that's going to stand out most for you? So we're just going to open the poll again and then let's see what comes back. So that's open. Okay, how's that looking, Charles? Yeah, looking good. We're eighty percent people voted, so we're still waiting for a couple of stragglers. Um, we can wait a couple more seconds if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple more have just come through. Maybe wait five or six seconds, wait for the last stragglers. Yep, one more just come through just then. And I will now close the poll and I will share it. Adam, can you see the results on the screen? I can't unless I'm missing something. Uh, can you sit? Oh, hang on a minute. Hang on just a moment. If I get my glasses, then I can look <laughs> over onto my second screen and then I can see. So here you go. I'm admitting to you all that I'm as blind as a bat. Right. OK, <laughs> so we have the benefits that would help our business. So avoiding litigation, 45 percent. Yeah. Satisfying customers, 55 percent. Understanding tasks, 38 percent and staff knowledge, 36 percent. So that's really interesting. That's um, uh, yeah, certainly litigation, um, 
yeah, whoever's answered that 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 is uh, the most important thing. Obviously, that's probably you know if you're in a high risk um, sort of industry, you've got high risk processes, then that's going to be absolutely critical. Um, satisfying customers is um, that's really interesting. That's come out of the top at fifty five percent. The reason why I find that interesting is that understanding customers um, uh, requirements from a, and looking at them from a sort of a compliance obligations point of view is something that a lot of people find challenging um, and they're not always fully aware um, of what the, the customer requirements might be over and above the sort of right delivery on time and all those sorts of things. Certainly a lot of the like the, the prime manufacturers and the brands have um, supplier agreements uh, that are put in place so, and sometimes sharing out the information in, in, in the organization is uh, problematic for people. So again, that's something that's really good to put into a, a compliance register because then that can be shared with the appropriate people. Um, and then understanding tasks and staff knowledge. I, I kind of lumped those ones together really because if, if staff know what the legislation is and they understand it, um, then usually they're able to understand and then to carry out those tasks better as well. And certainly Alistair will be able to sort of speak to that later when, you know, we, we've got examples where people have got confused with like waste transfer notes and things. So um, that's really interesting to, to hear. So good. Thank you for that. Now, before we go on to the next one, here's another little poll that we're going to do. So how many uh, either new or amended uh, bits of legislation, pieces of legislation that affect ISO management systems were released, have been released so far in 2024? So this is another poll. We're just gonna, this is the last one of the polls. So this is a question. Because um, we see a lot of legal updates and we see one or two things in uh, in these legal updates uh, every month. Um, so we just wanted to get a feel for, for what you think the flow is. So how many legal updates do you think there have been so far in 2024? And these relate to the ISO standards. So 50 plus, 100 plus or 300 plus. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, we're on 82% voted. Um, so wait a couple of minutes. Uh, we've got a couple of seconds, unfortunately, uh, for the yeah, last no, couple of okay. come through. Yeah, 50, 100, or more than 300. Yeah, I think we're a minute now. So I'm just going to close it and then I'm going to share. That's okay. All right, here we go. Right, so 42%. 50 plus, um, I mean, yeah, 50 plus, 42%, 100 plus, 42%, same number, and 300 plus is 17%. Now, technically everybody's right because the question, you know, 50 plus, of course, there's been more than 50. Has there been more than 100? Uh, 42 plus 17, think you're right. The answer is over 300. So 300 legal updates have been released so far in 2024. It's a huge number. Um, and those that, that number is, um, is sort of split between um, either new bits of legislation um, or amended um, pieces of legislation. I'll go into that in just a second. So th there's a huge amount of, um, uh, of stuff that's coming through from the um, from the EU, from the UK. Uh, if you're in the Republic of Ireland, then there's, you know, there's a, uh, a quite an amazing number there as well. So, it, yeah, 140 new bits of legislation, 180 am amended bits of legislation. Um, it is a very big number. So I'm just going to um, give you an example. So hang on a sec. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen a second. Uh, all right, just got to figure out how to do this. Right, okay, so, yep, there we go. Right, I'll just check that one. Let me turn this on. 
and I'm just going to give you some examples of new and amended uh, legislation. So let's have a look. Okay, one second. So I'm just going to Uh, one second, one second, one second. Oh. Sorry, I've got all these webinar things flying around my screen. So I just want to come off of that a sec. Right, let me just start sharing my screen again. There we go. We're back on. So um, uh, I, I didn't want to turn this into a plug, but the best way that I can get the information on amended uh, things is actually to look into our tool. So uh, this is a, a list of uh, recently um, sort of updated, um, you know, bits of legislation um, that have gone through. So um, this is in no particular order. But if I just pick out um, the supply of machinery safety regulations 2008. So that is a, a piece of legislation that came in um, in 2008, actually came into force in 2009. Um, but this has been updated um, and the reason, so this, this is a useful, if you're manufacturing, um, if you're supplying manufacturing uh, or buying machinery, um, then this is a, a key bit of, of, of regulation that you're going to need to understand. So this has been updated um, and you can see we've got three updates. So the one that came into uh, force in, in 2024 um, was actually, it was actually called the Product Safety and Metrology, et cetera, Amendment Regulations. Sorry to be dull for a second. But you can see there that there's, uh, on, on within the, um, the appropriate departments within government, um, this one is, is talking about um, this regulation, uh, the safety machinery has been updated by the Product Safety and Metrology Regulations. Um, and what those are, are doing is bringing into play some enhanced safety standards, um, some more things around accurate labeling and metrology, um, some mandatory compliance reporting, and then also some recall and instant reporting procedures. So if, if you're um, like buying, you know, buying to, to distribute um, sort of like this kind of machinery or you're selling this kind of machinery or you're manufacturing it, then these are the sorts of things that are really useful for you to know because you might need to uh, enhance your uh, production standards. You might need to improve the information that you're providing with products. Um, you might need to uh, enhance the way that you're, you're doing your sort of co like compliance reporting or uh, submitting safety tests and all those sorts of things. So this is where if you really understand what the uh, regulations are and what the, the legislation is that affects your business, then by keeping this kind of regular update um, going and understanding that, then you're in a, uh, a really good place. And then if I just look at um, one more example, so if I just look at some um, new um, new requirements, one that's come in uh, quite regularly, quite recently is the Online Safety Act. So um, this is, you know, primarily impacts sort of online platforms and services. Um, but again, there's sort of requirements from this from the Online Safety Act. So, you know, duty of care for online platforms, uh, things around prohibited content, user generate, you know, things that people need to understand, like user generated content, uh, transparency reporting and all those sorts of things. And actually, we heard on the news today some of the things that um, uh, Meta have done uh, was it TikTok or Instagram actually yesterday um, have done to to improve their platform and those things have come out of uh, the Online Safety Act. So the Online Safety Act actually came into force in October last year 2023 um, and then what you can see here there's a number of sort of commencement regulations. So the Act came in place in last year and then what there'll be is a schedule that um, all of the um, so there might be certain parts of it that come in at certain times um, and that's all kind of in the guidance. So then you can see you'll, you'll know um, what you need to do uh, and by when. So, you know, understanding your legislation is, is really, really helpful. So let me just go back then to our presentation um, here. Uh, and as I've alluded to, 
um, there's different types of, of compliance let, re, obligations. So seven different types that we would talk about. So uh, primary and secondary legislation. So primary legislation would be um, an act of parliament. So for example, the Environment Act or the Environment Act 1995, the Environment Act 2021. Um, so those are things that set out a broad number of um, sort of requirements, if you like. They are saying, right, in these areas, these are going to be the, uh, the ways that those things are controlled. The secondary leg legislation, which is the regulations and the orders that come out, those are the more transactional things. These are really describing how those acts are going to be brought into to force and what people need to do. And you can see here that there's a couple of different types. So we've got the producer responsibility obligations, packaging waste regulations 2007. So that would have come out as a, a direct result of the Environment Act 1995, so in 2007. So you can see it's quite a long sort of lead in some of this stuff. And then you can see here that the producer responsibility obligations amendment uh, around packaging waste, uh, this amendment here amends some of the things in that earlier regulation um, and they've been brought into effect because the Environment Act 2021 has sort of pushed through additional sort of requirements. So again, understanding your primary legislation will help you understand when it comes out the, the secondary legislation. Other types of compliance obligations that you've got are compacts and treaties. So uh, the Basel um, agreement, there's a Basel agreement on transboundary waste. So if you're shipping things abroad, if you're shipping waste abroad rather, um, those are agreements that have been set up between nation states about who can do what. Um, one that we see quite often, especially for electronics manufacturers and people dealing with um, uh, you know, waste and electrical things are is the Stockholm Convention. And quite often what a, com a company will do if it's based, if it's non-UK based, it will have in their supplier requirements that the suppliers meet the requirements of the Stockholm Convention. So if you understand what that is, then you'll know that's all about persistent organic pollutants. So again, it's just, it's useful to understand. And then we've got uh, so compacts and treaties, then you've got regulatory obligations, things that come from the regulator, things that, you know, people like the HSE or the Environment Agency. Um, so um, in Scotland, you've got uh, things like the guidance for pollution prevention, GPPs. Uh, in uh, across the UK, you've got ACOPS, approved codes of practice. And again, understanding those, certainly for, for ACOPS, those are things that you can be um, you know, prosecuted if you haven't followed um, and you have issues. So those are um, requirements that sort of come out of legislation and, and get sort of transfer, trans described more than anything in, in these different uh, guidance or codes. So again, useful to understand. Um, and then I talked about contractual and customer requirements. So those obligations from customers like conditions for supply, reporting requirements, all of those things beyond the sort of um, delivery requirements or the, um, uh, you know, the, the product standard things. Those are um, some of those contractual obligations. And then we've got supply chain requirements. So if any of you are in construction, um, the SSIPs, the safety systems in procurement, the Achilles, um, the Achilles audits. Um, if you're in aviation or military, then, you know, JOSCAR, by signing up to JOSCAR, there are um, certain requirements that you need to do to get onto that register. So those are compliance obligations that you can uh, reference in your register. And then, of course, you've got the standards like the ISO standards, IEC standards, if you're looking at um, sort of electrical safety and all that sort of thing product standards, past standards, so, you know, like past 2060, past 2080, I know some of those are changing in, in the near future, but those are other things that you might have chosen to, um, those past standards might be other standards that you've you've chosen to, or your sector is kind of demanding um, that, you, that you comply to. So seven different types of compliance obligations. So you can start to see that this is a real kind of um, wealthy area in terms of knowledge and understanding um, and, and if you understand that then your you know your business will be uh, in a much better space so I'm now going to hand over to my colleague 
Alistair, who's going to take us through uh, processes for managing your compliance registers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to start talking the, sort of the based around the uh, plan, do, check, act cycle. The first thing we need to really look at is what sort of what sort of platform are we going to use to actually capture those compliance obligations. So it may be that you use a sort of a simple spreadsheet, uh, an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet uh, to capture your compliance obligations. You may even choose a, a piece of software like the one that we, we provide uh, at ISO Compliance Register. So once you've chosen your platform, um, it's a case of, uh, your, with your knowledge that you have maybe as compliance managers, just to gather those regulations and custom requirements, Acts of Parliament, and then to put them in sequence into, into your register. We would usually recommend that, for example, in an Excel spreadsheet, is that you filter those down per topic. So it may be that you have your environmental and management uh, compliance obligations, your occupational health and safety, information security, and your, your other requirements. Other considerations may also be that if you're a multiple site, it may be that you choose to have um, a specific register for sites because the processes are, are slightly different. So in terms of once you've set up the, the method in which you're going to capture those uh, compliance obligations and where you're going to put them in within your documented information, uh, we need to do some horizon scanning. So you can you can subscribe to a provider and receive those on sort of periodic updates um, to be able to get a sort of a known source of information. Um, or you could actually conduct that task yourself by, by using known source of information, for example, the, the gov.website or the, the health and safety executive. So once you've identified those pieces of um, compliance obligations then, and you've populated your, your, your initial um, spreadsheet or piece of software, then what we need to do is actually conduct an evaluation. And it may be that you use uh, some of the, 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 the heads of departments or sort of the expertise within your organization, or maybe the use of consultants to, to actually evaluate those, those elements of, um, of, of those bits of regulation and compliance obligations. So you need to really understand how those, those obligations apply to your, your business. So at that stage, what we're doing is we're populating the information into our, our compliance register and writing down the associations within, within our business. When you've conducted a horizon scan, you've, you've identified a piece of uh, potential compliance obligation, you've evaluated it, then we need to ensure that those compliance obligations are communicated. So usually we would find a process in which once that initial review has been done, some form of assessment conducted, or we would sort of, this is really gonna um, impact on our business. Therefore, that, that information is um, communicated to the process owners. But also it's important, very, very important to sort of um, make sure that sort of the leadership, uh, leadership teams are kept informed of, of those compliance obligations and that they, they can acknowledge and participate in the discussions about some of those new, new pieces of compliance obligations that um, come to fruition. So once, once we've got that information, we, we, it's important that we create some document control around those obligations. So as mentioned, if we've got a, a, a uh, if we've got an Excel spreadsheet, it's good to have an additional tab so we can actually demonstrate the tracking of those, those different requirements. So we know over a period of time which particular pieces of legislation we've included within the um, within the, the list, or which pieces of um, uh, which, which which piece of sort of reg regulation that um, you know that you, you need to include. And of course, we, we need to track things like revision statuses and, and uh, version, you know, typical version control that you'd expect within a, an ISO management system. Once we've sort of um, put that information together, um, in line with the plan, do, check, act cycle, we need to check to make sure that we've got some form of uh, process within our management system to support um, the uh, evaluation of compliance. So, Quite rightly, I mean, we, we often see a, a legislation list that's been put together. You've got an Excel spreadsheet. The information's been dumped into that spreadsheet, and then that's it, job done. Whereas it's a live, it should be a live document, a live, a live process in which you need to make sure from, from the information that Adam suggested that you've got all those new bits of compliance obligations being released. You meet, you need to periodically evaluate to see whether those uh, amended amendments or new regulations. Have been applied to your to your management system processes. 
so usually we would expect to um, within your your audit program is to 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 ensure that you've got um, some some methodology in which you're identifying uh, at a known moment in time a, a process in which you're going to evaluate uh, your compliance obligations to to satisfy yourself that the business the organization is is complying complying with those obligations in in terms of um, sort of custom requirements that may be uh, think periodic sort of contract reviews as well and, and making sure that the customer requirements are, are also up to date. Okay, so once we've sort of got that, that sort of plan, do, check, act process, horizon scanning, gathering information, reviewing it, communicating the information relating to compliance obligations, checking your compliance obligations, um, we, we need to um, sort of continue that process and continue horizon scanning. So this, this next slide, so information within compliance register, we've, we've just sort of put together a few typical elements that um, you can include within your compliance register. Uh, and this particular one, we've got a, a scope and purpose. So we, we, we would always recommend that you've got a scope and purpose for your compliance register so that you can demonstrate the boundaries of applicability uh, within your management system. And then you can understand to your your team members what what extent of control you have in relation to um, your your compliance obligations. So typically, you know, environment and health and safety, uh, information security. It's very very good to know sort of the, the that extent of control, uh, and and knowing what what the, the the register applies to. So across the top, we've got sort of the compliance obligation itself, which you've populated within your within your register, and then. As, as per the standard, it's good to uh, appoint some, some responsibility to that particular piece of compliance obligation. Uh, so as a, as a user of the system, um, in the absence maybe of a compliance manager, someone can actually see who's um, responsible for maintaining uh, and adhering to that, that compliance obligation. So the responsibility, it, um, from there we, we make sure that we identify, we usually identify the applicability uh, we would normally break that down into sort of direct, indirect, or information only um, in relation to those those obligations. So a direct would be sort of typical legislation, uh, Management of Health and Safety at Work Act, as an example, would be a, a di direct piece of legislation. Um, an indirect piece of legislation, I, I would uh, tend to use for an example of uh, CDM regulations. So CDM regulations, if you're in the world of construction. That's your bread and butter, day-to-day -day activity. Uh, but in the business, you may be a, a building owner, uh, where you may modify your, your sort of daily basis. You, you have no interaction, but you may modify your buildings. So therefore, um, you're going to um, you're going to be a, have to be aware of CDM regulations to make sure you're compliant when you're modifying your your, your building. So applicability can be very very useful. And information only. Um, so this example that we've used here relating to carbon reporting, it may be that in in the future um, that you, you're you're looking at tenders for different um, uh, different business, uh, and it may be that if you're dealing with government, that there's there's a particular uh, carbon related standard that you you have to be uh, you have to be aware of uh, in in that eventuality. So we would normally highlight as highlight that as information only within your management system register. Description of applicability, so that it's good to have an idea. So sometimes we become, or well, quite often we come across bits of legislation that, um, you know, we, our, our clients are sort of head scratching over and want, want some sort of explanation. So we, we would recommend that you sort of distill down the, um, the, the requirements and the regulation and have a sort of a very broad overview about that, how that piece of regulation applies to your, your business. And of course, controls. Controls are very important to, to have within your, your uh, legal register. So in, in the event that someone, uh, some, someone has responsibility of a particular piece of legislation, the controls may relate to, for example, check sheets, uh, procedures, policies. So some form of documented information link. Um, so in, in other words, you've got the, the register of legislation and other compliance obligations. But these are the actual controls out in the out in the sort of sharp end of the business to make sure that the um, the, the uh, legislation is being uh, conformed to applied. 
so what do auditors want to see so we we, we face um sort of we we, we face sort of um, sort of certification <laughs> audit maintenance audits and quite often uh, within that that um audit visit from your iso um so for example nqa um typically the things that they're, they're looking at is first of all sort of making sure that your register is up to date and making sure there's a process in place to manage your compliance obligations so do you have a documented procedure um, that, that's up to date that, that identifies um, maybe the sources of information that um, you're, you're using so that they can determine that they are they're accurate and, and they're effective so an up-to-date register with version control is, is very very important um, a process for identifying and assessing compliance obligations so this this may be so the procedure which I refer to um, making sure that's up to date uh, or, a, or a process map and then an audit plan that covers compliance obligations uh, by uh, competent auditors so the audit plan uh, usually we, we would have uh, as the standards say is that there, there, there is um, based on risk there, there is a requirement to, to sort of set a time scale in which you're going to review those obligations. So usually um, we, we would expect to see some form of um, acknowledgement of that within your audit plan. So it's a moment in time which you're going to go in and actually check those obligations. Or if you're using a piece of software, so for example, ISO Compliance Register, there'll be a feature within that tool in which you can demonstrate um, and, and set particular times in which you're going to revisit that piece of compliance obligation to um, to make sure that you're satisfied it's being effective so evidence that the compliance obligations have been reviewed um, so again the auditor will look at that for, for documented information and they may may look at the um, the version control making sure it's been revised and quite often we find auditors will, will have knowledge of legislation that's recently been um, released um, so, for example, recent packaging packaging changes, packaging obligation changes, the the the, the auditor will preempt that with your own organisation, um, and may just challenge you just to see whether you've you've used your process in, to capture that piece of um, that that piece of obligation, and that it's been applied to your your management system. Um, so, evidence that you are addressing new and amended compliance obligations to your system and, it, and its processes. We, we often find as well that in, in an organization that you'll, you'll have um, a group of people, so maybe a compliance team that are very knowledgeable about those pieces of um, regulation. But what we're finding is that it's very important that we, we communicate uh, within the organization some of those um, operational aspects of making sure that the, um, the, the obligations have actually been applied within the organization. But I've used an example here. Um, so, for example, the the, uh, the waste regulations 2011, uh, with the introduction of waste transfer notes and declarations, often we'll, we'll see um, auditors actually going and having a chat maybe with the warehouse team or those persons responsible for, for management of waste transfer notes, just to make sure they've got an understanding about what their part is to play, to make sure that when they're signing that waste transfer note, uh, or if they're accepting a particular item or releasing an item, is that they have full understanding about the, the legal implications relating to that that um, that process so so community just in summary communication of the um, activity of the related to that obligation is very 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 important to demonstrate to the auditor okay okay so um, that's the so we, we had we've meticulously planned this and look at that we're 20 seconds out so we we thought we'd we'd have 15 minutes for uh uh q a so first question is so we've got we got three iso 13485 was omitted from the new environmental compliance uh i'm guessing there uh so that was barbara who asked that one so i'm guessing that uh, are we talking about 13485 and the climate change question? I'm guessing that is the uh, that's the, the sort of the, the thing behind that. Um, the answer is I have no idea. I didn't write the standards and I'm not on the committee. Um, however, I, ISO 13485 around medical devices, um, there's probably not an organization who's got that in isolation. Um, so if you have 
got the new requirements around climate change, um, then you know more more to you. But why that was omitted? Why thirteen four eight five didn't have it? And uh, ISO twenty seven thousand one and nine thousand one and all those sorts of things did. Um, then that's a good thing. Um, I hope that answers that question. Right? Is there a good place to get information uh, to build your own register or is the route to utilize someone like yourselves to create and update it for you that's from uh, a chap called greg greg thanks for the question um uh, greg i mean it's uh is there a good place to get information to build your own register a lot of the information is is freely available on websites. So uh, the great thing about the UK, the EU, and um, uh, you know certainly European countries and and many others is that legislation is freely um, published on on government websites and all those sorts of things. So it is a um, you can get the information to to create your own register. I think our the pain point that we see a lot of people have is just the time to do that. So, um, you know, that is something we look through. We, we look through uh, legislation all the time. We actually have someone employed to review uh, legislation and then to, to sort of uh, see whether it's applicable against the standards um, all the time. So we're employing people to do that. Um, and then hopefully what our customers are doing is kind of you know, in their subscription services, then buying our time to do that and then to interpret the rules. Um, so you can do it. Um, you can choose, uh, you know, you can do it or you can sort of buy the time and, and get someone else to do it for you. Um, in terms of creating and updating a legal register, um, I think that's a, a kind of a partnership anyway, because we would help people create uh, the legal registers, um, but very much the updates are driven by you guys, you know, in, in terms of what you're doing within the organization. So, um, you know, f speaking from our experience, we, we've got examples where customers have um, got some help in to build a legal register. And then once they've got comfortable with the process, then keeping it updated, something uh, that they're doing, and then sort of we check in with them. Um, Alistair, what, what's your view on that? Um, the, the best well, place to get information to build your register? I think it's about being confident that you can interpret the information. Um, so that there are multiple sources. So for example, I mean, the, the Health and Safety Executive website is excellent. Uh, the gov.website the gov website is excellent for sort of sourcing information, but it's about, you know, you've got access to the information, but it's about interpreting it and seeing how it applies to your business. So it's about having a very good knowledge about your own, your own environment that you're working in um, and I think where the where the support comes in really is just that you know you, you can either speed in the process by by uh, cutting out that horizon scanning and having a company do that for you, or you can actually um, you, you can utilise a, a, perhaps a consultant that can come in and um, help you steer through that sort of uh, as, as we saw earlier with the numbers the, the, the massive legislation to see how it applies to you. Um, but it's about having a also a very good slick process. You know, not bogging yourself down with the process and making sure that um, that, that it's also communicated within your organisation. That it's just not singular singular person activity. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's a a team effort is always a, a good way to do this. Um, certainly, even you know, with with us, you know, we we run a business, of course, and and so having a um, a regular get together to interpret requirements to um, understand how they would affect a certain business and then what people have got to do, um, then, you know, that's very much within your organization. That's the, the kind of um, the process that is, is useful to incorporate into your, um, your compliance obligations. Um, Greg, I hope that answers your question. Um, third question then from uh, Christian. Um, is there a more efficient way to keep up with legal and statutory requirements against each ISO? Uh, maybe an ISO dedicated website for UK regulations and statutory requirements. Uh, I mean, uh, glibly speaking, Christian, this is why we developed our own, um, because there wasn't um, a particularly efficient way to keep up with uh, legal and statutory requirements. The, the Gov 
.uk website. There is um, a website, legislation.gov.uk, um, which is, it's a brilliant website. It's, um, you know, it's one that we lean on a lot for um, legal and, you know, the statutory and, and regulatory requirements, because everything that is published there from the UK website, um, from the UK government rather, is put on there. Um, and there is a wealth of information um, that is posted. But obviously, that's the you know the legislator is not particularly interested in the iso standards so um that's why you know we developed our website so that people could then um you know access our database of um our database of uh, legislation that we've put in there and that's where we've done that hard work that you can then say right well if i'm in um you know construction and i've got iso 14001 what's going to be applicable to me that's you know that's very much the uh, the sort of the approach that we've gone down. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of, of efficiencies as well, without that sounding like a plug, um, you know, again, what you're doing, like I answered to Greg, is is really buying our time to to sort of do that. And that's all incorporated in the, the subscription. So, but, um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Greg, for that. You've just uh, made me a little uh, message as well. So good. Um, right. Uh, da -da. Right. L another question from Barbara. Thank you for your question, Barbara. Uh, related to corrective action and preventive action, is it a good idea to initiate a preventive action request as a best means to evaluate new regulatory compliance requirements? i.e. what is needed to be learned, documented, and to audit. Um, Alistair, what do, you, what do you think? Is a preventive action request a good method to uh, evaluate new regulatory compliance requirements? Well, I, I would suggest that if you're, you, you've got, you do your horizon scanning, you identify a piece of uh, legislation, then immediately within your process, you have some form of um, Management, management process to actually identify that legislation and then to communicate the legislation. But then if you find that actually we found something here that you know we're, we're not necessarily in breach of, is then to use your existing corrective action process to manage it. So going through the, the typical things of immediate action, uh, the root cause of why you may not have picked up that, that piece of regulation before, so that you can plug any gaps in, making sure that the, your process is, is effective, and obviously then implementing your corrective action to to resolve any any legislation that you may have you may have missed and not be compliant with um certainly using within your management system under clause 6.2 you'll have uh, your process of setting objectives as well so it may be a piece of as adam mentioned if there's an act has been released and that there's a, a time scale in which some regulation is going to be released you may use your uh, objective process to to actually highlight it's almost like your action plan to to that you're going to have to um, allocate some resources to making sure that, that piece of regulation is assessed and, and implemented in your business. So, you not go off into a tangent to using a completely different process, but try and stick with your core processes within your management system to to utilise uh, corrective action. Yeah, I think that's a, a good answer. Yeah, I, one thing that we do, Barbara, what, what we have done is we've actually assessed um, all the, we, I call them routines, uh, those kind of routine activities that you have in your management system. So things like um, what you're referring to there, a preventive action process. Um, and then what we, when we like work with people, we, we'll kind of enhance their existing processes so that, you know, they make sure they've covered off um, you know, sort of legal and regulatory um, sort of obligations as well. So things like, you know, training processes that, um, as Alistair said, when you're doing a, um, when you're doing a competence review, um, you might say, oh, there's some new legislation that's come in. It would be really good if our guys had some, um, some competency and awareness training around that. So, you know, we'd set an objective, you know, the company might set an objective then to, to do those things. Um, so yeah, it, because it pervades all the way through the standard, there's there's quite a lot of opportunity to use a lot of the processes that you have already. Good. Um, thank you very much. Any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. Any other questions? 
nothing else coming through. Good. Well, in that case, I think all that remains for myself and for Alistair to do is to thank all of you that have come on. Um, if you'd like any more information, then um, uh, please get in touch. My email is at the bottom. It's um, adam at isocompliancerregister.co.uk. Um, and Alistair's is surprisingly Alistair at isocompliancerregister.co.uk. Uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn. We do publish um, quite regularly uh, articles. We do like summary articles and things, um, little fun facts and figures. We're just running a carbon month on our LinkedIn this month. Um, and we're very soon going to have some feature videos from NQA as well. So if you'd like to see those, go to our LinkedIn page at LinkedIn. Uh, dot company uh, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash iso hyphen compliance hyphen register or just search iso compliance register on linkedin thank you very much